Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Design Cinema. This is episode 65, No Undo. So the name of this episode is pretty straightforward. I'm going to be showing you guys two paintings that I've done that does not rely on using the undo, uh, the undo button, which is Control Z on the PC uh, or Command Z on the Mac, and no use of layers and the color picker. Now, why am I doing this? Because this is a challenge that we give to our students when they're learning how to do digital painting. Obviously, this is not how we work in the industry. So we all use undo, we all use texture brushes, we use textures, uh, you know, we color sample, we do all these things. But this is a good exercise that perhaps some of you will like to try out. So let me explain why, you know, what, why this is, comes about and why do we even do this? Because um, for our students, they all start with line drawing first because line drawing is something that's easily correctable when it comes to teaching. Uh, for example, you could put the horizon line down, you could put uh, the vanishing points and every line, uh, basically you cannot cheat. You, you draw exactly what is actually there. So when a student makes a bad mistake, you could uh, show that by drawing over it or zooming in to show how the line's not working. However, when it comes to digital painting, it doesn't work that way because digital painting or actually painting in general is the indication of light. Uh, you could actually zoom into a painting and nothing makes any sense. Unlike a line drawing, when you zoom into, a, say, a face or something, it's probably still a face and all the lines are still there, uh, especially the focal points of a line drawing, right? It could be pretty loose line drawing, but in most cases, the, uh, the definition with the design is being defined by the lines. A painting does not actually work that way. For example, sometimes a value will go away. You know, the side of a tree and a building can merge together. Things that a line drawing typically does not do. So therefore, to the learning curve for digital painting actually is quite difficult, uh, especially for someone who hasn't painted before or for someone who drew a lot. They'll find that painting is awkward because you want to tend to draw the painting versus paint the paint. So this is one of the exercises we, we assign our students for them to fight the fear of Photoshop itself, to really conquer the software before you get too deep into the painting itself. So what I mean by that, uh, what, it, what it is, is like when, you, when you're dealing with line drawing and a piece of pen and a paper, if you draw a lot on paper, you start to get used to what the pen could do, right? You could free flow across the paper, what you want to draw typically sort of comes out, or at least you have control of the medium. Photoshop, when it comes to painting, sometimes we could tell that the student's having a hard time simply controlling the use of the tool itself. Like they want to get this paint mark, but Photoshop is not letting you do that. Um, and also, uh, the, all these tools, Photoshop can be overwhelming when it comes to digital painting. You have so many brush settings, there's all these layer settings, there's all these kind of things you could do on the layers, and there's like unlimited times you could use like textures and settings. It's just the list goes on and on and on. And our philosophy has always been, let's do the best work we can using the simplest methods. So, and this is as simple as you can get. Let's bring up Photoshop, uh, start a new canvas, no layers, and no undos and no color picking. That means you cannot use a photograph and use the color picker to sample the colors. So let's come back to these paintings. So these three, uh, two paintings were done exactly that way. You can see on the bottom image there, even the line drawing was drawn on the background. So I didn't even uh, I didn't even start a layer for anything. In fact, the only layer I have is the borders, the black bars. You can see on the lower right corner is my layer setting. So the painting is actually just being done on a default background uh, layer. And then the uh, black thing above it called layer two right now is the just the bars to divide the two canvases. So this is the like uh, the way I like to work. But uh, yeah, I restrained myself from uh, pressing the undo key when I was doing this demo. Actually, it was quite hard in the beginning because I'm so used to having my hand on the command Z button that uh, I keep pressing it even though you know I'm not supposed to. So I think I, in total, did five undos during this entire process. So which I didn't mean to. So later, about about five minutes in. I actually moved my hand away from the keyboard just to prevent myself from print, uh, pressing the control uh, Z or, or undo button. So it's a very good exercise. In fact, when I was doing this myself, I haven't done something like this in a long time, but uh, about 10 minutes in or something, it actually felt really, really good to paint without any kind of, I guess, digital or Photoshop support. And it really makes you plan out your painting more than you usually will, which, you know, I got in the habit of uh, color sampling or using some texture for somewhere and just lay it down. And of course, those are valid working methods, but this is another way to look at a painting. And in a way, it results in a painting that to me, sometimes feels a little bit more rich, a little bit more organic, and also emulates uh, that kind of uh, realistic painting uh, look. For those who painted um, traditionally before, this probably is a very good way to transition into digital versus like, okay, I gotta do the layer things, or I gotta use multiplier or overlay. Don't, just use, use exactly what you have done in the past 
and try to apply it here and also use a brush just you know i'm using using pretty much just one brush for all this so um which is kind of like a chalky not chalk brush but it's kind of like a painterly brush and that's it and here i'm bringing in an airbrush to do the atmosphere but uh, the photoshop of course obviously have advantages when it comes to painting because you don't have to worry about the uh, the material the paint itself you know versus like if you're working with gouache you cannot paint like white on top of black unless you dry it and use some kind of plastic gouache but default gouache is water-based so you actually cannot go backwards so when you do a traditional painting in gouache you actually have to go from light all the way into dark uh, versus in photoshop you could go light to dark dark to light doesn't really matter so that's a huge advantage uh, let me talk about the uh, the paintings th themselves so i want to do two sets um for those who have watched my uh, shows before you guys know that i like to uh, work with multiple products at one time this way it ensures that i get a lot of products out and also if one of them happens to fail i also have another one that i could uh, use versus spending all my time on a single piece which doesn't happen too much in the design industry everything's in multiple uh, numbers so i want to do two scenes of a shipwreck because that's fun to paint um and one of them the first one that you can see me working on right now is taking place in a very kind of a cold environment the rocks are very jagged and uh, the, the water is also very cold there's probably a thunderstorm in the background somewhere and that's the kind of setting i want to uh, make for this one and for shot number two i want to set it in a more warmer climate maybe somewhere in the caribbeans or the grand pacific uh, in which the water is more tropical and you're getting some fish in the water so we're going to pick up a little bit of aqua green in the water some algae and maybe some life like coral or um, uh, like mussels or barnacles grow in the wood. So that way, if this was a real design project, we give clients a choice of design, of not only the mood, the ship, but also the total change of environment. So, but that's kind of almost besides the point. The point of this exercise is just to paint something without those, uh, the undo, the, the layers, and the, uh, what's the last one? The color picker, right? And for those watching at home, give it a try. Um, but to, give this a try you really have to be honest obviously because it's very easy to cheat and you know, use on do because nobody's watching you but if you're honest with this with this um exercise you actually could benefit some from it i think uh, i honestly believe that it's a pretty helpful exercise to stay honest and just try to paint and another advice is when you start these you could look horrible because you're not allowed to do undos uh, for example look at the bottom image i drew my sketch right on the right on the canvas i have to actually paint those white lines out i cannot just delete the layer so in the beginning, your painting could look very, very messy. So you have to stick with it. And that's something we tell our students here as well. It's like the first five to 10 minutes, this could look horrible and you have to just stick with it. Stick it all the way through. Hopefully believe that your skills will pull this off. And even if you don't, even if you spend four hours, five hours on the painting and didn't come out good, that what you learn during that process is so important during the learning curve. And the next painting you do, you will not repeat those mistakes. Where you repeat, you repeat less of those mistakes. And that's how one becomes better at this kind of stuff. If you give up early in anything, you know, like, oh, it doesn't look good. It's only 10 minutes in. And you're like, I ah, forget it. I'm not going to do this anymore. You're not going to make it because everybody goes through those processes of this seems impossible. This is way too hard. But it's those who sticks with it that uh, ultimately becomes good at their craft, uh, no matter what it is. Right. So well, let's talk about this, uh, this video real quick. It's been sped up this entire process in real time from uh, starting from nothing all the way to finish. Took me about two hours. So here you're watching everything reduced down to about, I think 38 minutes or something like that. So obviously it's been cut uh, more than half the speed. So, and later actually about uh, 28, 29 minutes in, you'll see I switch over to real time. And when that happens, I'll let you guys know. So you'll see me putting the actual small details onto these ships uh, for about uh, 10 minutes or so. And, that, and that's taking place in real time. All right, let's talk about the lighting here. Um, so for the first one, again, it's in a thunderstorm environment, but I did want to bring up a little bit of a warmth contrast. Um, so the, the overall tone here is a very grayish blue, very cooled palette. Um, but I did bring in that con complementary color of the light yellow on the upper left there to balance out the set. And to offset the composition from the upper left, I have the waves coming in from the lower right to uh, kind of just give you a nice Z axis read on the canvas. And also the cliffs on the lower right is going against the direction of the boat which is coming in from lower left into upper right so those are compositional uh, things that i did here all right excuse me as i take a little bit of sip of water here all right and now i'm bringing in a little bit of a sand color some just indications of um, a beach but it's pretty rough you know this water obviously is very very cold it's very jagged it's very sharp so it's cutting the rocks into these in a lot of wind that's why the rocks are jaggedy like this so it's not a 
very gentle movement of the water that's carving away these rocks. And that's the setting I want to put this, uh, this scene into. Those masks that fell over, those big things that hold up the sails, the, those are pretty tricky without the undo because normally what I'll do is, um, because those masks, they, they have a flow, they have a direction to them. And they, they actually affect composition. So normally what I'll do is because there's an undo key, I can actually go in there and experiment the, uh, the line. Actually, before I get to that, see how I did a horizon line and it went through my ship? Um, so it's actually, I'm painting it out right now. With, usually with the undo, I just undo that line because it went through my entire painting by accident. Um, but in this case, I couldn't cheat, so I had to actually just paint that out. Um, but back to those masts. Normally I use undo to see which direction, which angle is the best one for those masks to fall into the ground that create a very good composition. In this case, I have basically one chance to hit it. So it's actually quite nerve wracking. Uh, I think I got better at it for the second painting. For this one, I don't even know if I like the mask. For example, the lower um, left corner there, you see the mask to make a, uh, a X shape. I actually don't really like that too much, but I think I tried to recover from that later by um, kind of just uh, enhancing one of the ones on top of the other. So. But right now it's creating like this weird X, which is a, a focal point I did not want. The focal point for these paintings obviously is the ship themselves because that's where you're selling and the second read should be the environment they're in. And hopefully I try to capture that within these two paintings. All right, resolution wise, let's see, resolution wise, these two paintings started out pretty low. I think I'm only about 3000 pixels wide at this point. And later I will res these guys up to about 6000 uh, pixels for the detail phase and just being very patient and just going in. Like I said, if you get into the groove of this kind of stuff where you, your your mind accepts the fact that you're, you cannot use undo, that you cannot color pick from a photo and you cannot rely on photos to give you the, the details, you settle into a nice groove and you just start you just start painting. And it was quite fun. Actually, at this point, I'm starting to enjoy this process. I'm saying, hey, maybe I should do this more often. You know, give myself this kind of uh, restriction efforts, which then becomes part of the creative process itself. Right? Because it, it just kind of changes things up. Um, uh, for, for those of us here that, that do this every single day, you know, we produce paintings and drawings every single day, you could get repetitive sometimes. And just by changing a small factor in the workflow actually refreshed everything for me. So I started really enjoying this process at this point. Going, man, this is this is cool. You know, do the paint a little bit outside of your norm. You know, and I recommend a lot of you guys, uh, even you guys out there who are super professional, change things up a bit, you know. And I learned that from a lot of professionals out there who do this on a regular basis. You know, maybe every six months is like, I'm going to try out a new method completely. I'm going to start all my paintings with a red canvas or something. You know, just something dramatic enough that it forces you to kind of relearn techniques or reinforce techniques you learned before. Um, it's always a good way. Here I'm painting some of the white caps from the uh, waves coming in. All that water is making me thirsty again, so let me take another sip. All right. Let's see the time here, 13 minutes, all right, good. So in real time, this phase, this is what I call the rough phase of this painting. Uh, the rough phase, I timed it to about 35 minutes each in real time. So the bottom one was also about 35, 36 minutes, something like that in real time. And then the detail phase took another half an hour. So in total, each painting took about one hour's time to complete. Um, for those who are learning, do not, and I repeat, do not try to compete on the time side. That is something that when you have a lot of experience, you naturally get faster at something. But don't use speed as a judgment of quality. The, the two of them don't relate to each other. You know, you know, if you're learning, even if you have to spend 40 hours on a painting to make it look good, then spend the 40 hours to do it. Um, speed painting or, have, or the habit of finishing something in half an hour to an hour, but it doesn't look good, is not beneficial to anybody. So if you're learning to paint, you know, clear the weekend. If you're gonna try this at home and you're learning to paint, clear out the next eight hours, nine hours, put on some good music, get some, just some, some nice snacks and food or whatever and paint and just paint you know, even if it doesn't come out good spend that 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 block of time working um, and don't don't do these paint paintings like okay faint it in one hour so therefore i have to finish in one hour it, it does not work that way so you have to work at your own pace there is no wrong way to do this kind of stuff the, the thing we look for is how good is the result so whatever it takes and that's what we tell our students here because at first they do the same thing they come in and do these like very quick homework assignments. You can tell they spend like no time on it because that's how they drew before they came to a school. And eventually they'll learn that, wow, to do good work, the average time is about 10 hours, maybe 15 hours for a good piece of work to come out. And that's what they all do. And therefore they result in very good work <clears throat> because a good piece of work will get you very far. Uh, a, a hundred bad pieces will get you nowhere. So, and I actually think that you learn more from doing these very 
difficult exercises versus like just drawing a sketchbook two hours a day and you fill out like 10 sketchbooks that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but i think if you actually just do some really nice drawings or paintings and spend a ton of time doing it and try to make it as best as you can you actually benefit more from those exercises so i know i did when i was in school i think it took maybe five six paintings um to get a hang of it and another maybe five or six to start feeling out that you have total control over this medium versus if i just dis the speed paintings every half an hour, I don't think I would improve that quickly. So, because you learn from the pain, you know what I'm saying? It's, the, it's like the hard way to learn. You do these these long paintings, it's it's painful. You, you don't want to suffer the mistakes, you know? If you imagine you spent 10 hours and it didn't come out good, then you, you when you're done with it, you kind of come back and look at your painting and go, well, man, where did I make these mistakes at? You know, why, why did I do this? Why did I do that? Because you remember the torture that you suffer from making that painting. Therefore, when you start your second piece, oh, sorry about that, when you start a second piece, you hopefully don't do the same thing again. Versus if you do speed paintings, what's there to lose? You lost half an hour and go back to watch TV or something. You know, you don't you don't remember the process if you do it so quickly. So that's just my personal opinion at least. But uh, it's been working well for our, for our school um, in, in terms of teaching students to do these long assignments and very time consuming things. All right, let's talk about the second painting since uh, you know I'm kind of talking over this painting here. Um, so yeah, set in a more warm environment. I brought in some algae right now because I'm not color sampling or even ref I'm not even referencing these things. It's completely just eyeball pick colors. The green right now it looks kind of off, and at this point I'm actually quite nervous with this painting because it looks horrible. It's like oh man, this this piece is not working. But it's like oh man, why do I have to combine two paintings into one painting? Because now I cannot like redo this design because the because the top one's already there. So I'm like oh, I guess I have to just go through it. And this is what I'm talking about. It's like work through it. You know, even this painting right now to me does not really work. I'm like, I think I could save it. I think I can make this work. Let's let's try to bring the uh, composition in first, right? Let's get a nice comp going and we'll slowly correct the colors that are not working, which is that green. It, it looks pretty bad right now. I think later I, I bring a little bit of a yellow in because so much blue, you get that much kind of neon green. It's going to naturally make a little bit of a more yellow color, right? Because blue and yellow, uh, blue and green come together, makes that color. So I'll yellow that down a little bit and then start bringing the atmosphere, start bringing that depth of field into the ship to make it look big, uh, bring in the perspective. And I think uh, pretty soon here, it's going to start working. Right? I hope, you know, at least to me, I think it works okay. Um, also start bringing the key lights on the uh, bow of the ship. I brought in a little bit warmer tone. I think at this point, when I brought in the kind of an orange sunset is when the painting is starting to come alive for me. It's like, okay, this this is starting to work. Yeah. Because this complementary color here really start to start to make the painting come to life, give it a little bit more energy. So before it just felt kind of dead. It didn't have that warm caribbean like a hawaiian sunset which i wanted in my mind that's the kind of look i was going for you know like you're walking along the beach in maui or something you know on the on the harsher side of the island not the smooth sand side right because you know, most islands have two sides this is the harsher side of the island with the um the sh it's always in shadow and you get the cooler winds even though it's a tropical place so that's what i want to capture and you discover this ancient abandoned ship that's been drifting there for the last you know 10 years or something so and that's that's the look i was trying to go for and that's what I want if this is a video game, that's exactly the kind of feeling I want the player to experience. Like they're in this tropical paradise um, and the water looks really, really calm and there's all this fish in there and then you come across this dead man-made, uh, almost like a beast of an object just lumbering there. And it's probably slowly drifting in the water. It's making some wood, old wood crease sounds. And what that makes you want to do is you want to explore that thing. And that's that's exactly what video games you know, designing for them is about, you know, leading your eye into the subject matter and uh, and exploring. So I think here I kind of just skipped over it, but I started adding some of that yellow into the uh, that nasty green, that neon green I had earlier. And hopefully that helps. I also added some brown into the rocks to give it some natural colors. It's base colors. To all to signal that this place is a little bit more warmer because the upper painting is a colder environment. Uh, I think you're not going to find too many tropical fish in the water. They're going to find mostly like sharks and uh, you know crabs are probably there, but no, nothing like a Nemo type of uh, uh, you know, Caribbean type of thing. Whereas this one, if you go into water, there should be hundreds of fish uh, swimming around. The waves are also coming in uh, much more calming. It's almost like a they're massaging the rocks versus crashing against it. So. And that's all very important when you are designing for clients uh, or designing for yourself, doesn't matter, is that you're trying to communicate as much as you can in these paintings. And there's a goal. For, for what I do, this goal is communicating the overall package, which is the design, the mood, the lighting, the, the environment, the detail. Everything has to be conveyed. So that way, hopefully somebody else, maybe one of our students, could take over this painting and 
break it into production drawings in which they all design the ship out and design the rock surface out for it so a 3D modeler could actually build it. But this painting will always be used as a reference for the look and feel they want to achieve. So when I was younger, that was to be my that's to be my job. You know, somebody else will paint these crazy good paintings and I'm gonna have to go in and turn it into a line drawing and turn it into a production thing. So nowadays I don't do that as much. I tend to do work uh, similar to what you see here. Right, here's the mask stuff that I was, I was talking about earlier. Pretty tricky because I have no undo. And the direction flow of these beams is vital to composition. See, I hit a hit one. I did not like it. You see me painting out right there? I did not like that direction. So, but can I cheat? So I got to paint it out. So here I'm kind of experimenting. Drop one more. Uh, zoom out to check it. Looks all right. And put it in. And uh, once it's in, it's, uh, it's permanent. Actually, I shouldn't say that. Digital painting, nothing is permanent. I mean, you could wipe the whole painting out and do something else with it. So, and so that's something actually I do as a demo once in a while is take a painting and just get it about, you know, 60, 70% done. Take a brush and just wipe crazy marks off of the painting with no layers. And usually when you do that, you just see the student's eyes go, what did you just do? Why did you do that? You know, it's, it's also part of, of building the confidence is that, okay, if I make this horrible mistake on a painting, don't lose out, don't, don't lose hope. You could still fix it. And that's something I actually did uh, for an exercise not too long ago at my school, which I, I took a painting, just wiped line, you know, lines all over it. It's like some kid came along and wiped the crayon over your wall or something and then recovered that painting. Uh, it's another learning process. So, And you guys could try that. A lot, you have to try that in this process. So, You can see here me painting out the uh, white lines um, that came from the line drawing earlier. And the cool thing about not using undo's or using a brush to do everything is that your paintings take this very rich feel, you know, very traditional because this, these paints and colors are stacking constantly, right? You, you, do, a, you do a mistake, you stack it. You, you do a color you don't like, you stack it. You know, everything you do is being stacked. So you have this painting that comes off very rich, even though it's loose, it's a loose painting. It has this kind of almost an oil feeling um, painting to it, right? Because of stacking and layering the colors. Because default Photoshop is very cold. Photoshop is it's a software. It doesn't know anything. It doesn't know what you're trying to do. So if you use a default brush and don't really do anything and rely on undos and 500 layers or something, you can actually come off super, super clean now. And that, that could be a look you're looking for maybe for some projects, but for the kind of paintings I like, I, I like uh, traditional looking paintings. I like things that has a lot of teeth on it. I don't actually don't prefer uh, personally like a lot of the uh, super clean paintings that are out there, you know, that, and that's just a personal choice because I grew up with this type of painting and I like it. So. At this point, I said the water, I think I added some greens into the water as well, some aqua color into the, into the water, just to warm it up, to, to signal that there's algae in the water and this water is a little warmer. And not too much waves. I actually ended up putting a little bit of a wave at the hit at the tip of the boat, just to direct your eye there. But I want to make sure that the water here is coming in very gently. So if, if, you, if you're here in person, you can almost hear the wave just slowly crashing against the beach, not coming up and then recessing down. Versus the top painting, you hear these waves literally crashing against the uh, the cliffs and makes a huge sound, right? And those things hopefully could be communicated within the painting. So the uh, the sound engineers and all the 3D modelers and the VFX guys could uh, bring that into their work. Here I'm aligning the um, horizon line, the bringing a little bit of the white horizon to the left side here to complete the painting, to, uh, to draw your eye to the left side. Compositionally, this almost has an opposite composition as the top one, uh, in which the rocks are coming in from the left side here, and the uh, what you call it, the uh, ship is also coming in the same direction, but the energy level is flowing in from the uh, bow of the ship, that huge tip, uh, sharp tip there, and just slicing across the canvas, and then one of its masts, you know, which is right in center screen, is slicing in the opposite direction. So hopefully, I'm using that to create an interesting composition. Now I'm creating some algae that's growing onto this. Uh, um, ship something I avoided doing because I thought it was too hard that's completely like a, uh, a a scary part on my side because I didn't want to try it which is to paint the uh, the sails themselves because it kind of doesn't make any sense these ships are kind of uh, wrecked here but their sails are gone you know that the wood is still here and everything because the sails a canvas material it'll probably still be here um, but I just thought it was really hard to paint that um, I didn't have reference in front of me for these unfortunately I should have uh, to have some maybe real sunken boats with sails uh, in my mind, I just thought it would be a tricky thing to paint because sails, uh, with a canvas, is a light value material. It's inherently default light, so usually white or um, eggshell colored. So I thought it would be really hard to paint that on, on waves because the two values would start mixing together. So 
I didn't even attempt it, fearing that I'll probably mess it up and I have to redo the whole thing. So I kind of just opted to not paint it in these two paintings. I guess if it's a video game and it's a big thing, we could always like make a story for it. Like maybe some some villagers came along and like um, they took they took the canvas to make a roost from or something. I don't know. You can make some story to hide that fact. But, but in this case, um, it was done because I was too scared to try it. <laughs> so maybe next time, maybe next paint I'll try one with the, with the sail canvas floating because that could be cool. Yeah. Here's the key lights being brought in um, to hit the bow of the ship with this the perfect spotlight coming in. Because remember, you are the photographer, you are the uh, controller of these scenes, and we are lighting these things for cinema, for uh, cinematography or for for entertainment purposes. Uh, my purpose here is not to paint a photo real thing. Oh, look at that! That little black mark that showed up. That is a bug from the Wacom driver, man. That's not even me purposely doing that. You know, once in a while, the, the uh, Wacom tab will make a random line on my canvas. But because I couldn't undo, I actually had to paint out the Wacom driver's problem. It's not even mine, you know what I'm saying? But it's not it's not bad, it still puts it in. Uh, puts in the paint marks. But anyway, back to my point of lighting. Uh, keep in mind that we light for entertainment, we light for cinematography, we light for a purpose, you know, setting a product. So these are not meant to be like, okay, the sun is here, it has to be perfectly uh, coming in from this direction. Of course, if you do that, that's fine. And there are those who paint our lighting extremely realistic. Uh, for me, I, I don't think I'm just good enough to do that kind of stuff. So I just kind of paint it look good for my shot. But I try not to make obvious mis mistakes like having two suns or something. But if you ever go to a film set, that's really what it looks like. I mean, there's like hundreds of lights on the sets. They'll put like spotlights on a table, spotlights, you know, hitting the guy's shoe. Even though guy's like sitting outside, uh, you know, in the middle of New York or something. But why is there like so many lights? Because they're, they're shooting this for film, you know, shooting it for entertainment that uh, if you rely only on the sun, you're gonna get hard shadows, you're gonna get things that doesn't read, you're gonna get stuff that fades into the background too quickly or too fast, or highlights are too bright. So these are all being controlled to bring a nice experience to the viewers. So you're getting a art directed scene versus a naturally shot scene. And that's exactly what these paintings are doing as well. Uh, I'm putting a lot of art direction to make sure it looks nice as a single painting and not necessarily 100% exactly what the lighting should do in this, in this scenario. All right. And you could change everything you want. You could like, if I want to make a shadow come here, sure you can. The shadow could be from a cloud. The shadow could be from a cliff. It's off camera, so it could be anything. So in this case, you can see the sun hitting the, just the bow of the ship. Why is it doing that? Where is the shadow coming from? From the uh, on the left side of the ship, well, it could be a big cloud, right? Uh, it could be the top of this a volcano that's to the left of this uh, camera. Who who knows? You know. And you can also see the uh, the aqua uh, blues that add into the water. That I think that really captures hopefully. The, um, the Caribbean or Hawaiian kind of the, the Grand Pacific kind of water color that I wanted to make it look like you're in the, you're somewhere in the South Pacific and discovered this awesome shipwreck. Here I am turning off the black bars to show you the um, what the canvas looks like below it. All right, so this is uh, real time now. You're looking at uh, real time. I spent about another half an hour at this point uh, pinning these. But you just saw me do an undo. That was one of the accidents that uh, you can actually see uh, cut on film there. I did a quick test just to test my brush and then I undo the brush out. So that should have been kept there. So here it is turning the black bars off. You can see the bottom there, all the uh, the paint uh, leaking through. I actually want to show you this to show you that it actually takes on a traditional painting feel when you do this. Uh, because this is how traditional paintings were done as well. In which we take a canvas and we tape, uh, we use masking tape and tape the uh, about an inch uh, border around the painting. So this way you could paint and when you unmask it, you could use that section to, for framing. But sometimes the paint will actually get into the mask uh, if you're not careful. And you end up with these kind of paint marks and it, it looks kind of cool, actually. Um, same thing with matte paintings. If you've ever seen a traditional matte painting, the matte painting were painted like this ultra tight, super photo reel painting into the actual frame. And then right outside of uh, the shot or the frame, you see the paint uh, come out and it looks like you know some rough oil paintings. And that contrast is so cool to see. So, and what I showed you there with the black bars, hopefully capturing that same feeling like the inside paintings control and all of a sudden you get all these colors leaking out. And, and that's something you get when you work with this kind of traditional uh, mindset. You get that look. So this is me detailing. You can see quite boring. That's why I fast forwarded uh, the first part. And also I skipped some of the detailing phase for you guys so you don't sit there and uh, stare at a pixel being manipulated. Um, but this process was, was not that uh, slow either. It, again, it took about 35 minutes or so to detail these guys up. But you can see it's pretty boring on camera small brush and just moving around capturing the focal areas in this case the mast with the uh, uh the ropes and stuff 
a lot of these tall ship stuff they're so cool um at the school what I, the reason why sometimes you see me doing these or trains or whatever is because i'm trying to make students like other things besides uh, you know things they see in a video game you know it's like if a game comes out like skyrim or something then everyone just want to draw snow mountains or something but the thing is there's so many cool things in the world that are just cool like mayan temples are cool old steam trains are cool classic cars are cool biplanes are cool you know these old ships are cool so what i do is i kind of do my demos and some students are, will indirectly start drawing you know old ships or, or old trains and stuff and they make them realize there's a lot of cool stuff out there that are real that doesn't come from a video game and if they open their mind and start looking at the world they could get a lot of designs that way versus like your only influences from video games which you know it's not a bad thing but it's also not super creative you know obviously video games uses tall ship as well but th this is because tall ships are real you know what i'm saying they're doing the same thing it's not like oh this is from this game it's like no because these are real things that, that uh, are very very cool and built for hundreds of years and have tons of engineering involved and lots of cool interiors so we had a few students actually this term that drew some really cool tall ships and their interiors so and hopefully that's that's me uh, trying to influence them to uh, see the world <clears throat> all right i'm still keeping my menus up so you guys can see uh, what i'm doing uh, i just hit it for now but uh, still no layers um, you know no undos added a little bit of thunder or lightning sorry lightning in the background to kind of it's kind of cheesy i guess in a little bit uh, on that on that corner to put it there but uh, i want to just signal that this place is quite harsh in terms of the uh, the environment itself Now I'm painting my chalk brush. This brush is quite good for details. So I'm painting some of the dangling ropes. And I do these details last because something like a dangling rope, if I mess up on it early, it's pretty hard to paint out because the background's behind it. And if they're not on a layer, it's pretty much a nightmare to try to clean up that, that frame if there's like these really tight ropes in front of a background. So I do the background first and then paint these um, tiny details uh, afterwards. Now I'm picking up some of the texture of the rocks. Yeah, this if this was a... Um, a painting with no restrictions some of this could be now done with using photo textures to just pick up that extra level of density but in this case i actually have to go in and paint everything which is quite quite fun man it's very zen like at this point it's like for me i was quite enjoying this painting it's super relaxing it's like man it's just like sometimes simplicity is the best you know because you don't have to think that far because think about this as a as a production painting that you're doing for a client you'll be like oh man now i gotta go into my texture library and start looking for textures your brain is constantly kind of thinking ahead like okay next phase within the next five minutes i'm gonna have to go find some wood textures do i have any kind of rope textures i could use do i have any kind of rock and water texture you're kind of doing these kind of uh, things in your head while you're painting but in this case it's like nope i got none of those because it's not allowed to be used so therefore the only thing i could do is just paint and then you accept that fact and just start enjoying the process. You know, okay, I'm just gonna paint. Don't have to worry about importing textures. Don't have to worry about which cloud texture to drop in there. It's like, there's none, just, just paint. So it's quite liberating in a sense. <clears throat> now just putting details, um, not much going on. Yeah. So I know, uh, let's backtrack a little bit. I did mention that uh, in my previous episode that I was going to do a demo using 3D. So I'm going to try to do that for episode 66, yeah, 66, yeah, 66, um, because this demo came, kind of came out uh, spontaneously because I did this for our class. And I thought it'd be a good exercise for you guys to see. So I kind of skipped the 3D one, but I'll try to do it for the next episode. And also this one didn't take too long. It took about two hours to do. So the 3D one will probably take a little bit longer because I'm going to have to plan out that, uh, that episode a little bit better. Picking up some uh, reflective highlights of the sky into the deck of the ship. So yeah, so next week I will, not next week, but hopefully two weeks from now, I will try to get to the uh, episode 66. We are on term break now, so I have a little bit of time on my hands. Uh, not too much, but at least uh, one or two days that I could possibly pull off another episode for you guys. So again, thanks for subscribing and uh, commenting on our YouTube channel. We are watching that kind of stuff. So if you guys have questions or comments, uh, please continue posting. And also, we will hopefully be updating our new website soon. It's, it's being slow going because we're just so busy, but we're trying to finish that up for you guys because it is a community port we're trying to build so we could get some of you guys to participate uh, over there as well. And it'll be a lot more interactive between our students, uh, the staff here, me, and also you guys to hopefully create a nice design community with education uh, behind it and, and all free, by the way. So it's not going to be like some kind of pay thing. So it's all because I think to me, and all this benefits everybody else. So I don't care if you guys come to the school or, or whatever. 
long as everyone's learning and benefiting and having fun doing this, then the word about entertainment or concept design is going to spread. And ultimately, that benefits everybody. So we're trying to get that hub up uh, soon. All right. In the meantime, I'm sorry that this is a quick episode, but I hope this is beneficial to some of you guys out there. And I really hope some of you guys give this a try. Um, again, be honest with yourself. Start Photoshop and don't press that undo key, man. Try your best how to do it. Maybe give yourself like three or something. You know what I'm saying? Like you set yourself a simple rule or something to follow. And then just try to paint it. And again, give yourself plenty of time. Give yourself four or five hours to do this kind of stuff, at least. Right? If you can't, clear your entire day. You guys got a weekend coming up. So um, you know, right now it's a Friday, just in case you guys listen to this later. But right now it's a Friday for me. So you got a weekend coming up and uh, clear out your, your Saturday evening or, or something. Start at, like uh, maybe after dinner at 8 o'clock and go all the way to 4 in the morning. You know, And just try one or two of these paintings. But uh, in the meantime, I hope you guys enjoy this episode. Um, you guys could grab the high resolution versions of these paintings from my blog, which is um, blogspot.fainzudesign.com, or just search for my name, Fang, and comment blog. You should be able to find my uh, website uh, with the blog, and you can download these two images from. And uh, also, if you want to uh, interest in our school or question there, you can always email us at contact. That's contact at fcdschool.com, and our staff will be um, uh, there to help you out. All right, in the meantime, uh, thanks for watching and I will see you guys next time. All right, bye-bye guys.